So hello, my name is Pete Marzano and welcome to the Nuvasive Virtual Spine Conference. You're pleased you could join us for a discussion on sacropelvic fixation with Dr. Hamid Hassanzada. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Hassanzada for tonight's presentation. All right. All right, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Pete, for allowing me to do this. I'm going to talk about the sacral pelvis uh, fixation today, and I go go over the application and indication and um, review some of the biomechanical points and look at the different techniques for pelvic fixation. And at the end of the talk, we'll review some of the cases um, and see um, how I apply these to um, fixation. So when do you want to fuse your pelvis? I think Manny knows when, when we do it. So uh, usually we know that achieving the really solid fusion across the lumbar uh, sacral junction have been historically, but still a big challenge in spine surgery. Uh, usually conditions that require fusion to sacral mode, degenerative scoliosis uh, or structural lumbar sacral deformities, such a high-grade spondylolisthesis, um, lumbar and sacral tumor, and even neuromuscular deformity in a, a pediatric uh, patient population. So basically the indication for pelvic fixation is usually long fusion to sacrum. And a definition as long as anything above more than four levels, or if you um, have a significant deformity uh, across lumbosacral junction, or when you have an osteoporosis. So basically um, pelvic fixation is indicated uh, every time we expect a significant biomechanical stress up uh, on the S1 um, screws. And this, so really the question becomes, why do you want to fuse to uh, pelvis? This is an area that's very, very challenging. And um, again, having a robust, robust pelvis fixation as, um, is really important in achieving the fusion across the lumbosacral junction, but also correcting deformity and uh, leading to a, a better patient outcome and satisfaction. We know that the S1 alone is inadequate. It's the only mean of fixation and long fusion. S1 pedicle tend to be capacious and short. Uh, we know all when we put these screws, it's not as uh, good of a grip as it is in, um, in uh, um, remaining lumbar or thoracic spine. Sacral bone tend to be osteopenic. And that's why the S1 screw's failure is very high and it's reported up to 44% in a, a literature. But if you look at the um, evolution of the sacral pelvic fixation, and you can see there's a really a, a vast variety of technique that have been described over the years, um, such as like a Galveston rod, um, rod technique, Jackson intersacral rod, uh, the Cossack transiliac rod, and Pete and I witnessed Dr. Cossack putting those so it's pretty interesting. Um, and over the years, iliac screw become the gold standard. And recently, in the last 10 to 15 years, the S, S2AI, the sacral iliac, uh, iliac screws, um, gaining a lot of popularity. This is a technique that's been described by Paul Sponsler and um, Cal Kibesh at Hopkins. And uh, I have to really thank um, Cal Kibesh. And this, um, he borrowed some, some of his slides for this talk. We'll, um, when you look at the biomechanical aspect of um, pelvic fixation, why we need to do it, um, um, why we, um, pelvic fixation is important, uh, McCourt introduced the concept of a pivot point at the uh, lumbosacral um, junction. This is a point at the intersection of a middle um, osteoligamentous column on a sagittal plane and at the lumbosacral intervertebral disc on a transverse plane. So they concluded that optimal um, lumbosacral instrumentation would aim obtaining purchase between the iliac cortices down to the superior aspect of acetabulum. So basically implant that are going ventral to this pivot point uh, have a much better um, effective moment arm to resist flexion and will improve overall um, fixation strength. And the other concept is described by um, and Brian Cunningham and, and Michael O'Brien, but they, they described the zone of uh, sacral fixation. The zone one is uh, S1 vertebral body and the uh, superior aspect of sacral ALR. Zone two is the remaining of sacrum to the coccyx and zone three is the bilateral ilium. You see, and, and conclusion or the finding was that the fixation in, increases uh, from a zone one to three. So you can see in a pelvic fixation, the optimal pelvic fixation is if you got a lot of these zone 
um, in combination to um, uh, achieve solid fixation. So one of the common um, technique is the iliac screws um, and been used for uh, by many. And one of the benefit of this screws is it's easier to place. It's relatively easy once you have the trajectory and storing point, you just follow the cantellus bone and it goes um, relatively um, easy. Uh, it has a very uh, great stability in terms of reducing the lumbosacral motion. And it's been shown to be more protective on S1 screws than the intervertebral um, um, cage. But that comes really with, um, um, with challenges. So what are, what's your experience with iliac or um, S2I screws? Um, when I was a resident, I was at NYU. Um, we were doing mostly iliac bolts. Um, I think uh, they, were, they were good. I mean, obviously the fixation is excellent. Um, the downside I think was always trying to get the cross connector to get back to the midline or like, sort of like sort of the midline for, uh, connecting up to the construct. Um, but that being said, a lot of times we were taking iliac crest, so we were out over onto the ilium anyway. And so it seemed to make sense. Uh, we were there. Um, but when I was a fellow, we were doing exclusively S2 AI and it really is, um, a very simple thing. So if we don't have to take crest. Uh, my preference, I think, because again, I haven't done this a whole lot yet. But my preference will be to go S2 AI. It's, it was very easy to connect up um, and the fixation was excellent. And I think, uh, you know, ha not doing another fascial incision is an advantage, it saves time, saves blood loss. So uh, th th those are my thoughts on it. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and that's actually you mentioned all the problems. So you, what the problem with the iliac screws is you need to require a lot more soft tissue dissection to, to get into the storing point. Sometimes you have to even take a um, piece of um, um, bone to decrease the prominence, but there are, tend to be more prominent and the fixation seems to be a little bit less um, solid than the S2I screws. And then one of the problems also that it's it's offset from an axis of the spine and from the remaining instrumentation system. So it require connectors at the end of the case, which could lead to or be another point of weakness. And they have a higher rate of lucency and removal. And it's also uh, infection because of heart instrumentation. And that's the problem. This is a study from a um, Wash U group where they looked at the five years analysis of L5S1 fusion using sacral pelvis fixation using the iliac screws for spinal deformity, to look at the 67 patients, five years follow up. They found that the iliac screw had to be removed in 23 patients due to instrumentation prominence. They found seven broken screws and um, halos around the screws in 29 patients and no SI joint arthritis. So it's really significant um, number of uh, lucency and instrumentation removal. And if you look at um, historical data regarding complication, and we've seen that actually is um, uh, complication tend to be very, very high. That's why it was the fear of uh, pelvis fixation in the past because of the uh, failure of uh, instrumentation and a high rate of complication. This is a study from a, a Minneapolis group uh, where they looked at the long-term complication, long and short-term complication and long fusion uh, to the sacrum for adult um, scoliosis. Uh, it, they had 50 consecutive patients and they reported 10% of neurological deficit. Um, the majority recovered and also 50% of pseudotrosis. Uh, out of their uh, 50 patients, 11 patients had, um, had to remove some of the instrumentation. So you can see um, all these um, older techniques had their own limitation in terms of complication, fixation, and fusion um, rate. So one of the talked about one of the newer techniques is the S2AI or S, uh, S2LI iliac screws. So the beauty of this technique is really that it is aligned with the construct. It's anterior to the P, uh, PSIS, it's lower profile and rate of irritation is significantly lower and tend to have a better grip of the pelvis. And at least some of the studies shown to have a better grip of the pelvis and less revision rate and need for removal. So, and this is a technique that could be placed relatively easy. And once you know the anatomy and you get some of the um, um, feeling for the, uh, for the screw, it can be placed free-handed or very, very, very minimal um, radiation. And I use a combination of limited fluoroscopy in the majority of my cases if I cannot 
uh, places behind it, and anatomical landmark. So I, my starting point is anywhere between S1, S2, just ladder to that um, uh, um, uh, foramen. I make sure I stay ladder to my S1 screws and I use the cantilated gear shift and a guide wire to really minimize um, radiation in this case. I aim for the tip of a greater trope, which represents the AIS. And what I do is, uh, the beauty of the cantilated gear shift is really that you have access to the bone. At any given time, you can use um, guide wire to see if you're still within the bone or not. And that's a, um, that's a pretty um, simplification of this technique. I think Calcabase used the drill, um, Dr. Sponsor used to, at least when I was a resident, used to use um, the Jim Sheedy to place those. So one of the, the way I do it to minimize the radiation, I just pass it about five centimeter based on atomic landmark, my gear shift, and I take an AP view. If I'm above the sciatic notch, then I'm pretty comfortable and it advances another centimeter, and then I take a teardrop view. Then teardrop view gives me a lot of information in terms of a medial lateral and inferior breach. And then if the teardrop looks good, then I advance to 995 m m millimeter just pass the guide wire and then pass a tap over the guide wire and place my screw. So really you need a um, maximum of three or four um, shots of um, fluoroscopy and get it to place this uh, safely. Dr. Hassan Zada, just a yeah. follow up question on that. When somebody is newer to practice uh, or had less experience with these, wh where, where do they normally struggle uh, as it relates to the technique? Is it the targeting? Is it the orientation of the screws? What have you seen and what tips might you be able to share? Along yeah, so one of the, it's a little bit different feeling. So one of the, uh, this feels different than iliac screws, especially when you want to pass this eye joint. It gets very hard and we all, uh, at least as orthopedic surgeon, we get very nervous when we feel cort cortical bone because we know behind the cortical bone, there's something dangerous. So uh, that could be an, a nerve wracking feeling in the beginning if you haven't placed a lot of it. The other thing is you have to make sure, and people have done that, I heard uh, from a lot of people that they fell through the SI joint and followed the SI joint went anteriorly, which could be dangerous. But if you know their anatomy and they're doing a very good dissection of the landmarks. And I will talk a little bit more about it at the end of the talk, uh, giving the freehand technique. If you know your anatomy and dissect appropriately and looking for the landmark, then it's relatively safe. If you um, get your starting point in the right place, and especially staying lateral to the um, S1 screw, it helps a lot with reduction and broad placement at the end of the case. Hey, Dr. Hassan's out. I actually have a follow-up to that. So, so kind of as we're talking about tips and tricks, getting that teardrop shot, uh, are there any kind of shortcuts uh, to tell your C-arm tech in terms of getting the right angles so that you have the best look? So the easiest way, is if you go anatomically and you put your uh, gear shift based on um, tip of a greater trope, if you can feel the tip of a greater trope, but if you can't feel it, um, you can place your um, gear shift and let the extra technician to orient on that. Otherwise, my go-to um, orientation is 30-30, 30 rainbow going toward the teardrop oblique and then 30 uh, um, uh, cephal angle. That actually, by about 80% of the cases, shows a good um, teardrop. And if it is not because of uh, um, pelvic obliquity and orientation of pelvic, then you can adjust it with minimal movement. All right, this is a 71-year-old uh, gentleman, a case where, um, uh, with severe low back pain, some buttock pain, and uh, uh, you can see there's significant um, coronal um, curvature, not that much imbalance, but the, a significant uh, sagittal imbalance. So you can see having achieving appropriate pelvic fixation is very powerful to get your coronal and a sagittal correction. What is the beauty of a um, pelvic screw? It can be your lighthouse. You can connect on that and orient the rest of the connection and bring all the other screws to that point. So that's one of the um, ways if you have a good fixation in the bottom, it makes your um, deformity correction much, much easier. That's another one with significant um, lumbar kyphosis. Again, it could be used as a lever arm and cantilever it and creating the uh, lumbar lordosis. It's a pretty powerful technique. So 
One of the problem we have always is or, or a controversy in spine surgery. What do you do if you have a revision surgery where this, the bottom levels are fused? Do you still go to the pelvis or not go to pelvis? And that's, what do you do? Yeah, I, um, I would say I've only done one of these and I did not go to the pelvis because I felt like I only went as high as L2. Um, and it seemed like there was, I felt like there was a good solid fusion at, at five one. And so given that it was a, I mean, a relatively short construct, I did not. But to me, one of the questions is always, is this person at risk of sacral insufficiency fracture? That to me is a concern. Um, and so I debated, I go back and forth in my mind. I mean, that's really a good point. Uh, uh, one of the things is the, the, the reason why we go to pelvis to achieve solid fusion. The other one is really to protect the, your, your sacrum and uh, to protect your um, um, uh, S1 screws, right? And it's very common that even in a solid fusion, when you add more level to the uh, construct, the lever on the forces changes and the patient end up having a lucency in S1 because of the forces, or they break their, their pelvis. This is one of my patients um, that I, with multiple prior surgery, and um, I went through the, um, to pelvis, and I go routinely to pelvis. If I have a solid fusion, I do a short contract, as Dr. Dosol said, then I'll go at least one-sided to protect my um, the contract, to protect the sacrum. If I go, higher than T10, definitely bilateral, if not even more fixation um, to protect the sacrum and to uh, sh um, distribute the forces back to the um, lower extremity. And you can see that having a good pelvic fixation also helped to maintain the alignment over even longer period of time. And it's, uh, you can see sometimes what happens is the bottom screw become loose and patients started losing their, their alignment, size of alignment over the years. And one of the things, what you said is sacral fracture is a real concern. This is, a, I think, a case from uh, Calcabash where, um, where you can see, uh, despite solid fusion in the bottom, the patient developed um, sacral insufficiency fracture. And uh, the issue with these are that um, even if they heal and do not require surgery, they create a lot of... Um, and such alignment issues. Sacral kyphosis could be very powerful in terms of creating global malalignment. And this is, he went to a sacrum and to pelvis and get a phenomenal correction of a sacral a kyphosis. Coming back to your point in regard to bone graft, this is always a concern, especially if you treat um, multiple revision cases where you absolutely have no um, posterior element. So what do you do? What do you use for, for, um, uh, for fusion? And the, if you want to take some of it, um, iliac crest, the problem with the iliac screws that can be in your way and you can actually interfere with their fixation. Uh, the beauty of S2 I screws is that the starting point is anterior and inferior to the, to your outer cortex or the area where you take the bone graft and you can get quite a bit, 50, 60, sometimes 80 CC, um, um, autograft without really interfering with your fixation or um, or a screw placement. The other concern is whenever we talk about um, pelvis fixation is really radiation and everybody's afraid of um, excessive radiation and if you're not very um, knowing the anatomy and of um, pelvis you can spend a lot of um, fluoroscopy imaging to understand and that could be a uh, concerned long-term. But the new enabling technology has become a less of a concern. Uh, but this technique can be very well-placed free-handed. It can be very safe. A lot of literature is out there that's shown the accuracy and the uh, free-handed S2I screw placement. Same uh, result came up, uh, this uh, study from Larry Lenke's group. They looked at the 50 uh, or 45 consecutive patient um, where they put the S2 I screws freehanded. They reported a 5% rate of breach, median lateral breach. Again, no neurovascular injury uh, with this technique. Um, and the interesting part was that the breach rate did really did not differ significantly between the senior surgeon and trainee. So, but it, in the beginning, I really would recommend to use 
few fluoroscopy imaging. It helps to understand um, where you're at. It gives you the safety and the confidence. And once you understand um, um, the anatomy and get the, um, get the tactile feedback, then you can actually eliminate or reduce your imaging significantly. I think, Manny, you're there? Yes. <laughs> so I don't know. What do you think? How many images do you usually use? I Remember, you're still in fellowship. I know. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, like you were saying, I think we get one x-ray when we go about a centimeter or so in. And uh, uh, once we get to the SI joint and probably maybe one or two afterwards just for the teardrop to make sure we're in. So not more than four per screw. I think that's the maximum, I would say. Uh, but we can probably get it with two or three. Just one for once you're going through the SI joint and one for the teardrop is probably good enough if you're, you know, once we're moving. Yeah, and it's, it is definitely, um, um, if you need, you can have more images, especially in the beginning to really get the good feeling. Like I said before, the technique with the candlelit gear shift or Jim Sheedy is, the beauty of it is that you can have really, at any given time, you can take the inner part out and take a guide wire and feel for the bone. And that's, I think, increase the safety of this um, um, procedure. Dr. Uh, Del Sol, how are, how are you uh, currently performing the procedure, albeit you did one a few hours ago? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I start out um, similarly, uh, and I, I, I have a start point that's between, that's just inferior to the S1 nerve foramen. I go about a millimeter down and out from that, which is how Dr. Kabej described it because I've been reading his papers and trying to refresh my memory. Um, and then once I, uh, I start with a burr, I push the burr through the cancellous bone, basically to the SI joint, and then I start shooting my x-rays. Um, I, I agree, I shoot and make sure that I'm above the notch. And uh, that's the point at which I obtain, my, I obtain my teardrop view and start making sure that I'm working into the teardrop. And um, I'll pass... Uh, well, once I get the bird of the SI joint, I switch to a lanky probe or a gear ship and I, uh, I mallet it across the SI joint um, under fluoroscopy. And once I get to a depth of 80, I palpate with a uh, ball tip probe, make sure that I have a clean corridor with no breach and then uh, tap, palpate again, and then place the screw. Do you use any navigation, robotic, anything like that? No, at my hospital, I don't have that right now. Um, so I'm just using fluoro. In terms of a freehand, it, uh, there's some additional anatomic landmark that can actually help with the uh, placing these freehanded. Larry Lenke and his group described additional point, which was a PSIS and this um, um, lamina slope of a um, sacral lamina. Uh, they're great points. I can see it could be very useful and um, sometimes you have to expose them or sometimes you have to feel for it. Uh, but I think with a very limited anatomy, if you expose appropriately your S1 and, and S2 foramina, if you know where the orientation of your SI joints are, I think it's very relatively easy and straightforward to place these. Another uh, technique is obviously where you can benefit from multiple air screws, the kickstand co construct. This is a um, relatively new um, technique for correction of a severe coronal malalignment where you put it as a, on a side where, uh, with the, where the body's tilted. You can get a very powerful correction without um, endangering your uh, screw pull out or breaking a, your, your fixation. And that's um, the other area where multiple iliac screws are uh, become very handy is if you use multiple construct, either dual construct or multiple rod construct then it could be very helpful to divide and distribute the forces down to, to multiple spots and avoid rod fracture and cementation failure down the road. So the key take, takeaways is really that um, pelvis fixation should be included in any long lumbar fusion. Whatever you expect high stress on S1, you should include um, at, um, go to the pelvis. It takes a lot of stress out of S1, increase the fusion rate across this lumbosacral junction. And biomechanical is really the location of implant is important. The length of implant is important. Um, the diameter of screws is important. Calcabash published a paper, um, I think 2012, where he shows um, the rate of a screw fracture increases significantly if you use the diameter less than eight 
Um, so if you go above eight, the rate's almost um, not present. Um, in terms of a sacroiliac joint irritation, again, Cal five years result shows no um, SI joint issues across um, um, in case we used um, uh, S2I screws. And we saw more and more paper coming out that uh, S2Is can be safely and very effectively placed. All right. Dr. Asenzada, question for you. Something that I've kind of wondered is tapping in pelvic screws, so S2II mm -hmm. uh, versus traditional iliac bolts. Do you tap line to line? Do you tap um, one millimeter down? What, what do you typically tap? For these these cases yeah so there's a couple of things if i use the guide wire and i use the majority of cases then i uh, pass my gear shift more than uh, the past the length of my screw and i tap the majority of cases line to line unless the patient bone is not very good then i go in half a millimeter um, uh, under tap that the key is the uh, it's very important, actually, if you have a strong bone, if you have a patient with a good bone, to tap it line to line because otherwise you can break. I broke screwdrivers, I uh, broke all kinds of things because the bone is very strong. And if you lose your momentum, it's very hard to advance the screw. So it's, I use line to line the good bone and under tap if the patient's off the product. Dr. Hasanzada, we yeah. purposefully did not include uh, S2 Ehler in less invasive discussion tonight. Most of your practice is, is more of an open deformity practice, but can you touch upon the utility of them in, in that, that arena, the less invasive arena uh, for the audience that'd be interested in the, that utilization? Yeah, so what I used, it, uh, I think it's very, very powerful tool if you have a sacral or a lumbosacral dissociation. Uh, you have already a, a lot of soft tissue damage, like a moral laval, a degloving injury. So opening this incision for placement of iliac screws, it's uh, very dangerous. There's a lot of um, it's very high risk of infection. So you can actually place the S2I screws percutaneously in a, in a fractured trauma setting and uh, decrease the rate of, in, of infection. It's very powerful and it's very simple to place. The key is really to use a midline incision rather than para, uh, a paramedia incision for a placement. I use one incision for, uh, for bilateral placement and it's about four centimeter and just dissect it uh, with the cop, go to the starting point, put my starting point under AP and just follow the same, same um, steps. And as far as you, your ability to um, get the rod placed and everything else? Definitely, I think it's um, uh, because it's in line with the remaining construct, if you do a, a triangular fixation for a, for a lumbosacral dissociation, it's right there. You just um, uh, place it is right in the same same line with your L5 or S1 um, um, screw. A couple of cases we I did overall uh, seven um, lumbopelvis um, dissociation with this technique. It works very well. Patient do very well, and rate of infection so far. Now I just said it. I'm sure something gonna bad gonna happen, uh, but it's it's very good. I think Cal reported a case report a couple of years ago where he used a um, percutaneous technique for his, um, um, sacral insufficiency fracture. Well, Dr. Hassan Zana, thank you very much for this evening's discussion on sacral pelvic fixation. Appreciate your insights, your learning, certainly your experience from where it was born and bred and through your clinical experience at UVA. So thank you so much and have a wonderful night. Thanks very thank much. Everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.